so my new newest book healing that came out in April is about me as an oncology nurse, then becoming a breast cancer patient and how seeing care from the patient side was so eye-opening and not a good way because I suddenly saw how little compassion or empathy is built into the system. That was Teresa Brown, New York Times columnist and best-selling author. She's our guest for this episode. We talk about her career in oncology and hospice nursing, how she became a writer, and her latest book, Healing, the personal story about when she moves from nurse to breast cancer patient and survivor. Hi, I'm Sien Xiao. And I'm Sammy Winemaker. We talk to people who have information and tips on how to unlock a better illness experience. The waiting room revolution starts right now. Oh my gosh. Hello, Sien. Hello, Teresa. Oh, hello, Sammy. We are excited to welcome to the podcast today, Teresa Brown. And I am excited to be here. People may not know this, but you have... You started as with a PhD in English, but then you pivoted your career into nursing. So I'm yes. curious, what, what drove you to, to make a, such a big career change? Yeah, this, this is what I call the million dollar question, as in people feel like you would have to pay me a million dollars to make that same change. <laughs> <laughs> now with inflation, it's probably 2 million. Um, yeah. Because I've been a nurse for, you know, over 10 years now, but um, yeah, so my dad was a professor. He's retired now. And growing up, I would see him and I just felt like, wow, that, that just seems like the best job in the world. You know, you're with, you're with young minds and you're, you're talking about ideas and, but you're also helping people at a, an important time of their lives. And so I got my PhD and I, I was teaching at Tufts university in um, Boston here in the U S and uh, I just felt like, wow, I, this is not really my dream job. Like I like mm. it. Um, and so then it's kind of like, wow, I spent six years getting a PhD. What do I want to be when I grow up? And in the midst of all that had my kids and it was really after having my twin daughters and going through the pregnancy and, um, I had midwives and perinatologists and then they're fine. They're 23 years old now, um, ended up learning a lot about just healthcare, not just pregnancy, but healthcare. So what drew you to nursing? Right. So being a professor turned out was not my dream job. Had my twins, um, had a friend who was a nurse who visited the girls were about 16 months old. And I told her the midwives I had, I said, I thought they had the coolest job in the world. And she looked at me and she said, Teresa, you could do that job. And I thought, really? <laughs> Never occurred to me. Um, and then I, I looked into accelerated nursing programs and, oh, I could go back to school and take these science classes I never took. And that was it. Literally a month later, I was taking chemistry, um, um, you know, at college level chemistry class. And I never looked back and my initial goal was to be a midwife. Then once I got into nursing school, I found out, wow, bedside nursing is such a great job. It just doesn't get the respect it deserves and doesn't get the, uh, you know, pay that it deserves, which is why nurses are striking all over the world. But, um, you know, it, it just is such a fabulous job. And I really fell in love with bedside nursing. So yeah, when people ask me like, are you crazy? Like you gave up having summers off to be a nurse. And that did kind of give me pause, like, hmm. but, uh, <laughs> <laughs> but actually I have, I have no regrets. I've never looked back. Like, when did you become both clinician and writer? Uh, yeah, I taught. Yeah. Yeah. I, but I, I didn't do writing like this until I became a nurse. Um, okay. Yeah. And actually it was, uh, I, I was still a pretty new nurse. I had a very bad patient death and which I, I've, when I talk about this, I found out is a pretty universal experience for nurses and doctors. And, and again, I don't know why, but school doesn't prepare you for that. It just doesn't talk to you about, yeah, people can just die really suddenly and dramatically and it's horrible. Um, which is kind of another topic, but anyway, I couldn't get it out of my mind. And so I thought, well, I'm going to write this down and then it'll be out of my mind, which doesn't work. Um, but, but I liked what I wrote. 
-hmm. And so I thought, well, aim high, I'm going to send this to the New York Times mm -hmm. and the, the Science Times, just a Tuesday section of the Times published it. And it was from that piece that I got the contract for my first book. Mm -hmm. So it was really having something to write about. And I, I really didn't like academic writing, which was part of why I didn't want to stay in academia. But this kind of writing I love. And I think it was that the urgency of what there was to say. And at the moment, I'm not working clinically. It's it's so tough for nurses in the US right now and in, in Canada, from what I read, um, and in the UK. Mm -hmm. um, but so I'm trying to figure out yeah. So if I'm not writing about my clinical experiences, you know, um, what, what kind of writing am I going to do? What am I going to write about? And I'm figuring it out, but yeah, it was really the clinical work that gave me this opportunity to have a story to tell. And then turned out that I loved doing that kind of writing. So I feel very lucky that that worked out. Well, it's more than worked out. I mean, you've written some amazing books from those experiences. You started your career working with cancer patients in a cancer hospital, and what you saw there led you to write a number of popular books, right? The first one being called Critical Hair, about stories from your first year as an oncology nurse. And the second is called The Shift, looking at four patient stories during a single nursing shift and grappling with some of the challenges of modern medicine and dealing with dying. And both are amazing books. Um, great pieces of writing, and listeners should check them out. And my question really stems from what happened after that, because you actually left being an oncology nurse and made the change to become a hospice nurse in the community. And so what was the reasoning there? Um, yeah, great question to switch to hospice care. And what led me to do that is <clears throat> two things. One, I felt like in the hospital, I never saw patients fully as people. Um, you know, we bring them in, we stick them in this small room, we make them wear this horrible, ugly gown, e even though our long-term oncology patients, they could wear their own clothes. Now people bring in pictures, bedspreads, flowers, but I just, I never felt like I really saw them as full human beings, or it was very hard to do that. So I wanted that experience, but the other harder truth is that I saw a lot of bad deaths in the hospital. And I really wanted to see some better deaths and also bad deaths that were just, you know, so avoidable. Mm -hmm. um, and would write about that and wrote about it uh, for the New York Times and then ended up making some of the doctors really angry because they felt like these are our decisions and just a very difficult environment to be in. And I'm sure both of you have seen that a lot. Um, but, you know, and knowing how often actually in situations where there, there's, somebody is so fragile, there's really nothing that can be done that's going to cure them or even make them better, but there are things that can be done that will prolong their agony and um, not to put too fine a point on it, but for people listening, that is sometimes what happens. Mm -hmm. And to, to watch that and feel like even when patients or family members expressed ambivalence or why are we doing this or what's going on, they still would not be given the whole truth. Mm -hmm. And I think sometimes nurses I worked with thought, well, you just want everybody to go on hospice. And no, I just want people to know what they're choosing. You know, if somebody says, no, I want to, I want to die in the ICU. I want every possible tube in my body. If there is a 0.001% chance that that will save my life, I want that. Um, you know, most people, what they've been through and they're suffering at that level, you know, they won't make that choice, but they weren't told what they were actually choosing. And I'll just tell you one story along those lines of we'd had a long, I worked with bone marrow transplant patients. So we really got to know people and they would leave and come back. And this woman's husband was the patient. She, he was not my patient that day, but this is how desperate she was. She came up and 
grabbed my arm in the hallway and she said, I feel like everyone else knows something that I don't. And, um, you know, that's just terrible. Isn't that horrible? Yes. Honestly. But you know what? It's true. And so we can't deny that. Uh, there is so much that we know as doctors and nurses that we could share with patients and families, but there are all these um, assumptions, misconceptions, and uh, man-made barriers <laughs> that prevent us from feeling invited. Um, or, or in addition to that, it's, um, we just assume that they're not going to want to have all the information. And so we we're like protecting them from it in a way, but we're protecting ourselves from having to talk about difficult things. <clears throat> and, um, there's this weird vortex that patients and families pick up on, like the, the person you're talking about saying like, I just feel like everyone's talking about me, like something's being held from me. That is such a terrible feeling in a situation where you want to be uber trusting. <laughs> right. <laughs> and that, that's, yeah. And by the time people get on hospice, they're pretty much always angry. Um, and a very good friend of mine, who's a pastor once said, well, is, is, don't you think some of that's displaced anger? Like they're angry at the disease and they take it out on you. Yeah, no, it's because they have not been told the truth and they're furious about the whole situation they found themselves in. It's like, yeah, it's, it's so hard to explain it because it sounds like it's so intentional, right? When it's not like, it's not like nurses and doctors and healthcare providers are purposely lying or keeping things from, it's not that. And I know that's not what you're saying. That's not what I say. And CN says, it's what you're not saying though, that is harmful. Uh, even if it's not intentional, it's neglecting to go there into those corners that can be harmful. Um, and it's not usually the illness the illness has its harms and of course, but, but it's, it's the way we, it's what we don't do. That's harmful actually. Yes. <laughs> uh, more than what we do. Like, like for example, um, you know, when we describe treatment options for people and we're trying to help them make a decision that's best for them, but we ignore the option of not having treatment or what this will look like if you don't choose treatment, it's like the null <laughs> option, then really we haven't described to them uh, all the information they need to make a decision about what they want to do. So people go in the ICU, they accept fifth line chemotherapy, they do all these things because they weren't permitted to explore the road of choosing not to do those treatments, right? Right. And this is making me think of, so my new newest book healing that came out in April is about me as an oncology nurse, then becoming a breast cancer patient and how seeing care from the patient side was so eye-opening and not a good way because I suddenly saw how little compassion or empathy is built into the system. And I have to tell you, honestly, I've always idealized Canadian, like, oh, if only we had healthcare like Canada, but then I've learned over the years that you guys have your own issues with empathy and compassion. Mm -hmm. um, but just recently I made the decision to completely stay off tamoxifen, which is a, a drug women who've had breast cancer get after breast cancer um, to help prevent a recurrence for people listening who don't know that. And there was a whole mess up over the drug and another drug I tried and then let's throw a different thing. It's a very long story. I ended up switching medical oncologists and, and I was talking with my new medical oncologist about this. I could, I could see, I could see the wheels turning and, and he, he's saying, well, it's almost five years, you know, it, it's okay. Like he was really telling himself more than me, like, it's okay for you to not take tamoxifen. He said, you know, there's, there's this thing, shared decision making. It's <laughs> yeah. so adorable. Like I said, yes, I've heard of that. Yes. 
<laughs> but you know, I could tell he had a really hard time with it, right? Because it, it, people who've been in, if you meet an oncologist, especially in the U.S., they have an arsenal, and man, they want to use everything they have in that arsenal to keep you from getting cancer again or to, to keep it at bay. Um, so it was tough for him, but you know, props to him. He pulled out the shared decision making. Wow. And, and, and said, I realize I cannot force you to take this medication that makes you feel like you are half yourself. Mm -hmm. And I'm also going to meet you as a person with respect and tell you that that's okay with me. Yeah. Which was lovely. You know, and the more a patient veers from standard treatment or the otherwise known as the conveyor belt, yes. the harder it is for the healthcare system to respond um, with respect and compassion and, um, meet you there. Um, you know, so we, we try to encourage people, uh, to know themselves well enough to know what treatments might gel with who they are and which don't. And, but if you choose sort of to go this way, but the system typically sends people this way, there's a major tension that's felt and you almost patients have told us they feel like they have to cut themselves off from the healthcare system completely if they don't get on that conveyor belt. So even though we say, you know, we need to um, know your values and your, you know, advanced care planning and know what trade-offs you're willing to make and know yourself, your values, your goals, we say all of that. But when it comes to someone making a decision that isn't mainstream, then we say, oh, well, we didn't mean that. We didn't mean for you to make that different decision. <laughs> and they have trouble being flexible and nimble, I think, when you choose to go against standard care. That is such a good point, Sammy. Yeah, it's right. Like here's all these desserts and you say, well, really, I just want a piece of fruit. Oh, yeah. What? No, no, no. <laughs> we have cake, cookies, ice cream, you know? Yeah. Um, yeah. It's almost like it doesn't compute. Um, and it, you saying that also makes me think about this issue of all the battle metaphors that at least come in cancer care at the end of life. Mm -hmm. And I wrote about this in healing also, and it was the writer, Susan Sontag, who first talked about this in this profound way that, you know, one of the choices is keep fighting, right? Or there, there's, a, I mean, that is the choice, right? Keep fighting, keep fighting. Um, and we don't put that burden on other kinds of patients. Like we don't say that to COPD patients or, oh my, can you imagine patients with ALS? Like that would just be cruel. Yeah. Yeah. Um, but that's the other choice that you aren't mm -hmm. easily given the opposite or even told that language is not appropriate. You have a disease. Yeah. The disease has its own crazy messed up biology. Mm -hmm. um, you know, it's, it's not about you fighting. And yet I, I even had people tell me well, you want to have a positive attitude about your breast cancer. And I felt like, oh my God, I thought that was debunked 30 years ago. Yeah. <laughs> I know. Yeah. Well, let, let's go back to your most recent book, Healing. Sammy? What do you want to tell us about healing and who should read it? Who should read healing? Well, patients, but also clinicians, but ideally I would love for healthcare CEOs and upper management people to read it because we have so lost our sense of mission mm -hmm. in the U.S. I feel like we reached a point where we, you know, got our technology to a great point. And then the focus came, how can people maximize the profit from healthcare? And most Americans don't understand or don't know that the US spends vastly more on healthcare than any other industrialized country and our outcomes are worse. And they're a lot worse. They're not like just a little bit worse. So what are we buying with that money? 
We're buying really high CEO compensation. And we're buying money for device manufacturers, for pharma. We're not buying good care. And I would love for this book to excite people about the value and importance of compassion. And also what I show in the book based on research done in this book, Compassionomics, is that compassionate care can actually save money because people do better. They have fewer complaints. Actually, pain scores can go down. You know, making people feel well cared for, which has been the theme of this whole podcast, is transformative. Mm -hmm. It's not just like the icing on the cake. Mm -hmm. It's, you know, the ingredients, like a key ingredient in the cake. Um, and, you know, without that, care is just going to get more and more inhumane, worse and worse and worse. Um, and I feel like we've seen this so slow creep of incursions into quality of care in the US. Um, you know, people don't know the number, the number, the astronomical number of people in the US who die of medical errors. I'm sorry, it sounds like I'm getting off topic, but the point is if we have a system that's looking out for people, you're gonna have errors go down, you're gonna have the kind of mistakes that lead to bigger problems go down. Just everything would be better for patients and for clinicians because most people got into healthcare because they want to do good. Mm -hmm. And getting back to my point about becoming the assertive patient who asks questions, the other reason why that can make a difference is what I just said. Most people got into healthcare because they want to do good. And by asking questions appropriately that are about your care, that get to people's expertise, but also can pull at their hearts mm -hmm. and they can say, who cares I'm supposed to be done in 15 minutes? I have a human being in front of me who doesn't understand what's going on inside their own body. And I'm, I'm going to take five minutes and I'm going to explain that maybe I'm even going to take 10. It's what everyone in the system needs. And so that that's my hope of healing. And I would say the book is really kind of a hope, a prayer. Uh, it's my most personal book and it's my book that's most wanting to make change. Hmm. I love what you just said about how being a, an assertive patient can help reorient the clinician back to their own sense of compassion because suddenly you're off the cog or the, the, the um, conveyor belt and you've, you've forced a pause by asking a, a question that stopped them in their tracks maybe. And, and in a way it like jolts them and, oh, this is a person. This is a human, and this is actually why I did go into medicine. Uh, and so maybe instead of people being scared that they're going to be labeled a difficult patient, that they should be feel a sense of, of accomplishment that you are putting a, a person's face back um, mm -hmm. you know, into the equation by bringing your own personal question, questions uh, to the table. It is therapeutic then for the clinician to respond as a human instead of a robot. Um, so many students say when they come and do palliative care, this is exactly the kind of care that, that brought me into wanting to be a doctor. Wow. But, I, but I forgot it in all this training I've been doing that took the human side out of me. Palliative care brought me back to my calling. And so I think as a patient, a patient like you were a patient, Teresa, you can bring a doctor or nurse back to their calling by um, jolting them, like I said, by, by, by bringing very human and important and personal questions to them. I never thought of it that way, actually. Your book is really important for all the reasons that you mentioned, for patients, for clinicians, for CEOs, administrators, 
it's personal and it's um, an important piece of advocacy for sure. I read Healing and it really is your most personal piece of work to date. And you really show the struggles inside a patient's mind at various decision points, even for a disease like breast cancer, where survival rates are very, very high, like over 90% and more. But I think about some of the patients with diseases with worse prognoses, and really for every day, every illness, all the decision points along the way, and how each and every one of those decisions will affect their lives in profound ways, including um, all the way up to end of life, but even before that. And that's why decisions around end of life, which are so individualized, I really think it's so important to bring what matters to you forward. I mean, people can disagree about what's appropriate at the end of life. And well, I would, you know, I would want that fifth round chemotherapy and that's great if that's what you want, Mm -hmm. but other people would make a different choice. Um, I mean, I feel like we're saying the same thing. Uh, We're repeating ourselves, but at the same time, it's a point that gets lost over and over and over again, because it, yeah, it's, it is, yeah, I call it, you call it the conveyor belt. I call it the treatment train. Like once you get on the treatment train, it's hard to get off. Mm -hmm. Um, And that's what we need, you know, switches or let's Mm -hmm. stop the conveyor belt. Is there a different conveyor belt? Um, Can we just move you off the conveyor belt? Um, And, you know, at least in the U S the whole system is geared toward more. Let's do more. What more can we do? Um, And there's economic reasons for that. There's training reasons for that. There's ideological reasons for that. But what I try to do is say, let's bring this back to the patient. It's the patient's life. This is the end of this person's life. And so we need to let them think about how do you want your life to end? And the thing is, anyone who gets to really think about for that for themselves is lucky, right? Like you're so lucky if, I mean, we're all going to die, right? So if you get to think about how do you want to leave this earth and you can have some control over that, um, I have to see that as a blessing. And that that's, you know, that's where I'm coming from. I think what I'm hearing you say is that someone who dies in a sudden way, like lightning or a car accident, doesn't have the fortune of time uh, to, to know it was coming, to see it coming, to prepare in whatever way makes sense to them. There is a luxury, an ironic luxury of having a diagnosis of a known progressive life limiting illness that has a known rhythm and pattern to it with known chapters where you can get a roadmap if you wanted it, um, what this is going to look like. Even if you get ALS, ALS is well documented, same with Parkinson's and dementia. The silver lining here is time and time is currency, right? Because if I get dementia, and I know the average life expectancy is maybe 10 to 15 years with Alzheimer's, um, I can start wrapping my head around that after I adjust to that big news and start saying to myself, well, looks like the average person in my situation might have 10 to 15 years. And this is what it's going to look like the average person. So what does that mean for me, Sammy? How do I want to spend that time? What do I need to prepare? That's very different than a car accident. If I have ALS, I might have between two and five years, and it's going to look a certain way. These things are well mapped out and they're well known. They should not be withheld from people. People have the right to steer the last chapters of their life. It's not for nurses and doctors to decide what bits and pieces and scribbles of information we're going to leak out to patients and families when we think it suits them. They have a right to know there's a pile of information and that time is power. It's power to the person. I agree with you completely. It's not that you want everyone to go on hospice, but it's about people knowing that time is limited and you have the right to decide how you want to spend that time. It's the ultimate form of control when you can't control the disease. Talked about how hospice is about 
being the choice uh, of how they can end their life. And I think the waiting revolution is really about not just thinking about the end, the last weeks and months, but really recognizing right from the diagnosis that you have a disease that will be with you and it will probably be the cause of your last chapter um, and, your, and your death. And that could be many years actually. And all of that time and those decisions are things that with more information you might you know make different choices. So I think we are trying to go upstream and we and we try you know I that's the word we use, but I don't. It's not that easy. And so I just I wonder, you know, have you seen things that allow people to be able to infuse the the philosophy of hospice or the palliative care approach earlier, which is just good care which is just carrying medicine, pay, shared decision-making. But all of these things, you know, have been twisted and are scary to the public. When we say palliative care, palliative medicine or hospice, it scares the public because they're thinking death and dying. So we have tried to talk about the elements of that upstream, but it's still a challenge. I mean, it is still the thing that we uh, are facing. And I just wonder what your thoughts are of how we can actually go upstream. Yeah, well, I love it that the two of you talk about educating primary care physicians, you know, that you don't want this information and way of practicing to be isolated to palliative care. And I guess um, this may not be a great analogy, but here in the U.S. where abortion is so controversial, some people have said the fact that we have independent abortion centers made it easier for the right to abortion to be attacked because it made it seem like this is something separate from regular health care. Um, and, you know, it's just a, like a mental picture, right? Um, and maybe even shameful, right? Um, and so I'm wondering if palliative care being separate and not integrated, if that somewhat can prey on people's minds. But then I know, Sammy, you've talked about um, on your, in your online stuff um, about you sort of, you end up being the cavalry, even though you don't want to be, but because you're the person who comes in and actually tells the truth. And then the family says, oh, now we, now everything we've been seeing makes sense. Mm -hmm. Because mm -hmm. those pieces that got left out, they were like that woman in the hallway saying, everyone knows something that I don't. Um, so that can be very helpful, but not a great feeling for you, right? And then also you you get this then gap between the other practitioners and what they're doing and saying, what you're doing and saying. Mm -hmm. So I really am impressed with you guys having the idea of, can we get more regular physicians on board with this instead of splitting off palliative care and trying to find more ways for palliative care to embrace what it does. And I wonder also if talking about pain management, you know, as a way to do that, um, it doesn't just have to be end of life care, um, symptom management, right? And I mean, you know, this study, right, for patients with non-small cell lung cancer, I think that when they got palliative care along with curative care, they did better, they lived longer, you know, everything. And so that kind of research should lead to more of an incorporation of the idea of palliative care with people's treatment. And wouldn't that be lovely if in 20 or 30 years, it's just standard? Because the idea of saying palliative care, hospice care, palliative approach, just good old patient-centered care is everyone's business, um, is threatening to people who do splice it off. Um, and, and, and for my specialty, palliative care, it's like I'm saying, you know, we don't need us, <laughs> but we do need us now because it's not being done well. And it's absent from the curriculum of all nurses and all doctors, uh, pretty much. It's just serendipitous, or you might just decide to, you know, take it as an elective. And as long as it's absent from the curriculum, you're going to need specialists like me to come in at the 11th hour and fix it all up. Um, but over time, we need to, you know, unspecialize this. 
it's very special, but it shouldn't be delivered by a specialist. Right. <laughs> well, and that's what happened with that study, right? People took that study and said, oh, why they had better outcomes is because a specialist team came in and, and came right at the beginning, not what they actually did, which could be done by anyone. In and a way it reinforced that palliative care is so incredible when it's delivered by a palliative care specialist, people live longer, blah, blah, blah. Therefore, let's get more palliative care specialists. Let's specialize it more. Let's put the specialist in early. Let's, you know, and so, but really what I took from that is that it's the philosophy of care. It's the sitting and listening and being with patients and untangling things and weaving threads and connecting the dots. That's probably what made people not sad, not depressed, more hopeful, live longer <laughs> is because they were able to make their own decisions based on information. Uh, and so that needs to be part of an oncologist's toolkit a cardiologist toolkit, a respirologist, because all of these people will care for people with progressive illness. So we built ourselves a kingdom here called hospice palliative care. We do it so well that we shoot ourselves in the foot. Yeah, that's such a great point. And makes me think again, getting back to my own treatment. And when I went on tamoxifen and I would go in and I would say, yeah, I've got brain fog and I'm really tired. And, mm -hmm. you know, she would kind of make a note and um, no exploring of that, no asking, well, how much is that reducing the quality of your life? You know, oh, wow, you really feel like a different person? That's serious. Nothing like that. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, and I had a very, very treatable stage one cancer. Um, it, it, this should be easy, right? Um, for my oncologist to address that issue. But now when I've gone, um, you know, my last radiation oncology appointment in November, yay me. Um, and, <laughs> Hands up. Um, and actually the nurse who came in, she said, oh yeah, I saw you went off tamoxifen. Yeah, those drugs are really hard. You know, they are, those drugs are, and now it's like, now that I went off it, I'll have people at my appointments tell me, yeah, those drugs are, whew, man, you know? <laughs> No, oh, it's like once I, you know, now I'm like in the secret cadre of people right, who don't listen to medical advice. Um, but you know, it shouldn't be like that, yeah. right? The sort of you hiding. Feel like you're going rogue. Yeah, right. yes, I'm going rogue. Yes. Yeah. Um, to follow up on what you guys were talking about, you know, you guys were talking about, like, do you think there has been a change in public perception, or with all the different things happening, you know, the more death positive movement from the public, maybe some of the serious illness conversation guides or some of the tools about uh, an attention that this issue has had. Like, is there, do you do you sense a bit of a shift of, in the tides in the US or from where, when you give talks and you talk to the public? I I do. Yeah, I do. I, I get a sense that there's less discomfort with the word hospice people just seem more familiar with it and what the idea of it is. Um, I mean, I think in a way, uh, COVID might have had something to do with that just because people witnessed so many deaths, deaths where family members couldn't be there, where people were alone and it made people within healthcare understand wow, when people are leaving this earth, we need to try and be there for them in a substantive way. And, and I, I know nurses that were trying to do that for people just found it incredibly enriching and also incredibly exhausting both. So I do think there is a switch. Um, a problem we've seen here in the US, and there was just a big article on this, if people are interested in the the New Yorker and the organization ProPublica wrote a big article about the for-profit hospices in the U.S. and how that's really taking over a lot of ground in hospice and so patients aren't getting the care they need. So then I'm worried there's going to be a negative effect of that where people feel like, oh, we went to hospice, they just took our money and they didn't do anything for us. Um, so that would be really unfortunate because we seem to be at a moment 
where people are more open to it. Yeah, I, I think I, listeners would be blown away because you know you're in the system, like just like you're you're an insider, you are a healthcare provider, hospice and yet when nurse, you, yes. yeah, hospice yes. nurse, an oncology nurse, and when you when you were faced as a patient with a cancer, you still found it so hard to get the information. So I'm just wondering, you know, as you've seen both sides, do you feel like it was hard for you? And would, would you do, what advice did you have? What did you learn? I feel like it was hard for me, but because it was hard for me, I do have good advice. So um, in the US at least, that I hate to say this, but there are patients who get labeled difficult patients. Um, and these are usually patients who are seen as demanding. They ask a lot of questions that people can't answer or don't want to answer, et cetera, et cetera. So when I started out in my treatment, I thought, okay, I know how the system works. I just need to be very compliant and that's how I'm going to get the best care. And then at some point I realized this is not working for me. And I have this moment where it really was like, I was to myself, I said, wow. I, I am the difficult patient. You know, it's like, <laughs> I'm that girl. Because and you I were know. asking a lot of questions. Yeah. Asking questions saying, why is this going to take two weeks? You know, that's not good enough. Um, I want this result. I mean, and just even, even deciding, no, I don't like how my medical oncologist handled, you know, there's, there's, many different medical oncologists I could see. I'm just going to try a different one. Um, and if I don't like that one, I'll go to another one, you know? So instead of being afraid of, I'm going to be seen as someone who I can't be pleased. I'm so picky. I'm so demanding. Like, no, I want to understand my care. If I have a question, I want it answered. I do not want information withheld from me, um, which was part of what had happened. Um, and so what I am encouraging people is ask and keep asking, uh, you know, be polite because if, if you think about if someone's getting angry at you, what's a reaction, right? You get into a fight or flight mode, your heart starts racing. So if you get, if you yell at clinicians, that's not going to get you what you want, but just, I don't understand. I need you to explain that to me. If you can't explain it, can you bring in someone else who can explain that to me? You know, call every day if you have to. Call twice a day, insist, um, say, why is this going to take so long? Why can't it be done faster? Um, and really push for what you feel like you need. And if more people would do that, I think the system would have to adjust and, you know, we're bombarded in the U S with this all doctors only have 15 minutes to see every patient. And I realize it's, it's, it's kind of like a message. Like they're trying to indoctrinate us, right? Like don't expect too much. Everyone only has 15 minutes. No, go in and expect what you expect. You know, this is your body, your disease, especially people way sicker than I was. You need to know what's going on. Um, and only if we, you know, start a bottom up revolution like that, are things going to change and call back, get answers. Um, at one point, I wasn't getting a result of a mam of my first year mammogram. It was a three day weekend. And my husband, who is not on social media at all, said, go on Twitter. And it worked. The head of radiology read my mammogram and called me. Um, now, I don't know if that's going to work for everyone, you know, <laughs> but, and I don't like doing that, but it did get me the care that I needed, um, you know, and it, it shouldn't be that way for people. And so I tell everyone, expect what you expect. You expect kindness, clarity, full information, complete answers, every single time should be like that. And it shouldn't be such hard work. You're the one who's unwell. Yes. <laughs> you have to work so hard, but it's, I'm just listening to you say that when you're the only one doing that, being that difficult patient in quotations, which you're not, um, it, it makes you stand out more in, in almost a negative way to the healthcare system. Um, 
Whereas if everyone acted the same way or came to their illness story with the same vibe of being respectfully assertive, right? Um, mm. Then then you can't label everyone difficult patients. They're a new kind of patient. They're a brave new patient is what they are that have rights um, and, and are their own best advocate. I, I, it's, it's upsetting that you would have to work so hard to understand what's going on in your own body. What's next for Teresa? So you're not working as a nurse right now. First of all, I want to know, do you think you're going to go back? And secondly, if not, uh, and you're writing for sure, like, where's your mind at now? Yeah, I really miss clinical work. And so, you know, if the healthcare environment changes, um, you know, I do, I feel sad that nurses are striking, but say the nurses just went on strike in New York, they won 19% pay raises, they want a commitment to better staffing. Um, so if the healthcare environment changes in a way that it seems like, wow, I think I could go back to work without it making me crazy, that would be nice. Uh, but I'm also writing the newsletter, figuring out the next book. Yeah. And yeah. living life. Yeah. But the cancer is behind me. I'm figuring out once again, who I want to be when I grow up. Teresa, thank you so much for joining our podcast. It was awesome to talk with you. Oh, thank you so much. Yeah. We're big fans of yours. That's for sure. Teresa. It was such a pleasure to talk with you guys. Our meeting in Montreal was so auspicious and may the conversation continue. Thanks for listening. Don't forget to rate, review, and subscribe if you haven't already. You can visit our website, waitingroomrevolution.com, to learn more about our movement and how you can join it. The podcast is produced by myself, Kayla McMillan, Valerie Bishop, Shopa Jyothi Kumar, and Maggie Sivak. Our theme music is Maypole by Ketsa.